again, it's Beth Ernestos with a supplementary lecture on biologic reading. You've been reading a lot of different articles about biologic reading for this class, but I wanted to spend a, a little bit more time on it because I think it can be one of the most successful programs as a children's librarian. I also think it can be a big part of what you do both in-house and outreach-wise. There are a couple of conditions that I think make you more successful if you do want to do dialogic reading programs um, at your library. And one is to try and get as much background as you can in dialogic reading. Now, dialogic reading was the brainchild of Dr. Grover Whitehurst and um, his colleagues at um, SUNY Stony Brook. And he was groundbreaking in looking at picture books' effect on literacy. And many of his writings are still cutting edge today. There are many, many um, researchers in psychology and China that are still looking at his um, you know, primary source um, research uh, from the late 50s, early 60s, and still using it today and still delving deeper into it. So if you, if you get a chance to look at it, I would certainly suggest that that would be a, a good thing for you to do. There are ways for you to get, and I'm just going to call it certification. Um, I took many workshops in early literacy, emergent reading, um, you know, uh, speak and say. Uh, lots of people have put another name on to um, what was um, termed dialogic reading. When you say dialogic dialogic reading, it sounds pretty, you know, what's a parent going to say? What does that mean? You know, but I still use it because we're using it in an academic setting and it's important for you to understand what it means and, and how to use it. I used to also put on um, programs and these programs were basically promoted through the library and they were um, advertised as increasing your child's vocabulary. They were open to um, just about anybody up to the age of three, and I'll talk, you know, basically, you know, language development with dialogic reading is you're trying to prepare the child for kindergarten or pre-kindergarten so that you're preparing them with the largest vocabulary that you possibly can when they go to kindergarten. That being said, I never turned anyone away because in our library um, that was just not... Um, that wasn't promoted. But I did stress that the workshop was for small groups. It was, the intent was to be able to work one-on-one -on -one and also um, wanted to have small enough groups that we could be um, really effective um, so that we didn't have to have multiple sessions. Now those workshops were, were not considered um, something that we got, you know, that we pay, we charged for. They were part of our literacy program. We did promote a lot of picture books uh, and, and increased circulation from those workshops. On an average, I would have, you know, six to eight parents, caregivers, and six to eight children. And we would do a three-hour workshop. And uh, it was amazing uh, that I would have repeats. It was a series of three. You could take one or three. Um, and it, it really did... Um, it really did make a lot of difference in the community, especially um, to those children that didn't have a lot of access to, um, to books or to language acquisition in their home, English, English um, language acquisition. Sorry, I'm tongue tied today. So you've been reading about you know, what it is, you know, how you can use it. Um, in my little story time video, I did include a little tiny uh, piece of it. Uh, but I wanted to, to delve a little bit deeper in here into just some facts about why I, I, believe, um, I believe in it. I see a, a, a huge gap uh, between uh, socioeconomic groups in the United States. And that might be a duh statement, but taking it back to the level of what you can do to help um, increase vocabulary with your, your little patrons, story time is an, an excellent opportunity to do that. Bringing reading to kids that may not have a lot of books in their home, may not have somebody that can read to them because mom and dad are working 
or they're living with an elderly grandparent who um, is trying the best they can, but it may not be a situation where they're going to be able to, to do as effective a job. So yes, they have school, and you all know what classroom size and, and is doing. So the library is a place where you can really make a difference, and I really believe that. You can make a difference. So if you take some workshops, and there's a lot of them out there that are free, they're put on by you know, state associations, um, you might be able to, to find one for your school district, but learn as much as you can um, so that when somebody questions why you're using this technique, you'll be able to, to really involve them. If you do have a program, uh, much like PLAs, it's going to be a lot easier for you to implement that in your library, um, especially if you're public, but also in a cooperative setting, you might be able to collaborate with a, a teacher at the local elementary school, or um, I used to do a dialogic reading um, story time for our neighborhood daycare center. So there is an exceptionally good book called Growing a Reader from Birth. It's by Diane McGinnis, and uh, it's available on Amazon, and you can get copies for like $3 used, you know. So it, it's a good one to put in, into your professional library if you have the financial ability to do that, and especially since you don't need any copies. But in her, in her research, um, she goes back to look at how you can grow a reader, starting from when they're born. And this is some of the information that's come out of her research, but also out of uh, a multitude of other studies that exist. And it's in the difference of how many words different socioeconomic um, families and children actually hear and use. And it's pretty astounding. A professional family um, speaks between 1,500 words and 2,000 words an hour to their 9 to 12 month old child. By the time that child's 30 months, that level has gone to about 2,500. But when you compare that to a middle class family where 1,000 to 1,500, still pretty close, but you have 1,500 to 2,000 per hour, now you've got 1,000 to 1,500 per hour, and now look at the lower socioeconomic group, 600 to 750. So by age three, right, professional family child has heard 33 million words. The middle class families heard 20 million, and the welfare or poverty level has heard 9 million. Look at that gap between 33 million and 9 million. It's astounding. So by age three, you're already pretty behind the curve on your vocabulary, and you know what vocabulary does to all kinds of reading and writing skill levels by the time you enter school. And it's not just the words. It's not just having words. It's having the families, you know, your parents or your caregivers, um, having a richness of vocabulary that you're hearing. So... By age three in, in that study, if you look around and you turn it backwards, and so now you're not looking at what's being spoken, but the words that the child can actually speak. By age three, the professional child can speak 1,115 words. And middle class family, 750, and the poverty level child, 525. So there's a, a, a very... Um, important reason why we should promote vocabulary building and and not just vocabulary building but sparking that um, imagination and that encouragement that words are fun using your imagination is fun being able to talk and share and interact is fun because childhood is a time to be fun and you still look at learning as fun <laughs> at this age. So there's all kinds of creative things you can do. And we're going to look at dialogic reading and some books um, in, a, in a minute. So uh, according to PLA, over a third of the uh, children in the United States enter school unprepared to learn. They lack vocabulary, and this is a quote from a, a report that was done by PLA and ALSC. And it's the Preschool Literacy Initiative, but these are just some facts from it. Children like vocabulary, sentence structure, and other basic skills that are required to do well in school. Children who start behind generally stay behind. 
they drop out, they turn off, and their lives are at risk. He goes on to say that picture book reading provides children with many of the skills that are necessary for school readiness. Vocabulary, sound structure, the meaning of print, the structure of stories and language, sustained attention, sustained attention, the pleasure of learning, and on and on and on. It's a good thing. Uh, it's not just about love, uh, you know, about learning and about uh, the socioeconomic groups. All, you know, all these families, poverty level all the way up through professional, love of their children is not, is not the issue. Education of the parents, accessibility to services, um, just time. If you're working two jobs and you're struggling to keep food on the table for your family, you can't buy books. You might not have time to take your child to the library. So that outreach factor plus providing an avenue for the parent um, to, to maybe go to where their child is. That's why we started the daycare outreach at the library I was in, because these parents didn't have time um, to, to bring their children in on a regular level. Um, they did, however, want their child to succeed. I, I didn't um, meet very many parents that did not want their child to succeed. So what we're talking about here is impacting just one child's life makes all the difference in the world for that book. That's just one of my opinions. So let's look at um, what picture book reading does, because dialogic reading is really um, centered and focused on picture book reading. Um, we already talked about the fact that picture book reading provides um, those skills necessary for um, being ready to go to school. Um, how we read to a child is just as important as how often we read, and that's where we'll get into the dialogic um, technique in a minute. Children learn more from books when they are actively involved. So if you're the type of uh, storyteller that you want the child to sit still for 20 minutes um, and the child is two years old, it's a very unrealistic um, expectation. So. Uh, Dialogic reading is very hard to do with a big group because you want it to be interactive. You don't want it to be chaos. You want the children to be able to hear praise and get reward for their participation. And if you've got 30 kids, you're not going to be able to do that. So that's why in my story time video, you saw that I was asking you to um, sing a song, read a story, um, do some music and flannel board, read another story. Well, in dialogic reading, what I'm asking you to do is to work with smaller groups. Um, so dialogic, dialogic reading helps the child to become involved in the story. And it's an active partnership between the reader and the child. And we usually, as librarians, want to train the parent on how to do this so that they can do this method on a regular basis with their children at home. Um, I want to um, get into, uh, I posted on the, the class site a list of titles that I suggest for dialogic reading. It's very important that you pick the right books because if you don't pick the right books, you're not going to be able to do the method very effectively. Dialogic reading books can be in Spanish, they can be in Vietnamese, they can be in Chinese. It, that's not really the issue. The issue is what's your point in doing it? Who are you trying to reach? What's the community that you're providing either the program or the story time to? Um, I'm going to show you books in English today because they're out of my own personal collection and I sadly don't own a lot of, of uh, non-English books. The library I was in were mostly very um, very much into learning English as a second language and so we didn't really have a lot of books that um, we kept for the dialogic reading room um, that were not in English, sadly. But on my list, there are many, many different titles in different languages. When I was taking classes, I was taking classes from um, several different people that were really into emergent literacy and dialogic reading. The biggest effect on me was working with um, an early childhood um, educator named Mary Ann Dash. 
Marianne actually had the honor to work with Dr. Whitehurst and was absolutely one of the best people I've ever seen with the dialogic in her mind. She worked basically in a very poverty level school district with very um, Hispanic and African American population. And that's where I had my training um, with her. And we did partner um, doing uh, several workshops for parents in the library district um, that I worked in when I was a children's librarian. The book that she um, thought was the definitive, and there are so many books, but the definitive dialogic reading book was Eek! There's a Mouse in the House. Uh, this is hard to get a hold of, but I was able to buy about 30 copies of it to keep in my library. And I'm sorry that I can't show you the whole book, um, you know, because it's just not possible to, to do it justice. But if you can get a copy of this, this book. You read it over and over and over again in a dialogic reading situation, but every time you read it, the child that you're working